I think the streak is broken officially, Holly, because we've had a number of projectors who are like, talk to this person, talk to this person. And finally, we get somebody where we uh, there's no connection and we're going to become best friends by the end of this. That's the hope. <laughs> Lord willing. Crossing yeah. fingers. We'll see how it goes. I love it. Yeah. So uh, author extraordinaire. I, there's so many different words that I wanted to use, Allison, to uh, express who you are. But I think author, I mean, I could have thrown mom in there. There's so many other uh, athletes, uh, a person who does amazing things. Uh, what I could really just throw anything out there. But uh, let's just go with uh, Allison Brown. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Very good. Okay. Hanging in there. Awesome. <laughs> By a thread. Um, yeah. <laughs> we like to ask the skill testing question because we never know where it's going to go. And that is, who are you and where did you come from? Who am I? Oh my goodness. I think you nailed it when you said there's a lot of things you could say there. But I would I would start with, you know, child of God mm. who, who absolutely loves to inspire other people, help other people, um, ignite the fire within other people and show them who they are as well. And I come from Walkerton, Ontario, Canada, a tiny little town that most people knew nothing about until we had the Walkerton E. coli crisis. And then we were on the map, not for not for good publicity whatsoever. Took all but that time. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, I drink water a whole lot cautiously now. It's a question that most people don't ask, but I always say, yeah. is this water safe? Yeah, <laughs> I know. bet. That'd be traumatic to go it through that. It was a wild experience for sure. And seeing yeah. all the press flood into our town, it, like it was, it was amazing. I think I was in grade 12 at the time. Yeah. Wow. Man, I vaguely remember hearing about that. It just felt like that was a million worlds away. And yet here in Canada, it's, uh, hmm, it happens. Yeah, it definitely does. And so that kind of put Walkerton on the map. And then from there, I traveled to... Uh, lots of different places, actually. I did my uh, degree at Brock University in um, St. Catharines, Ontario, and then I did a second degree in journalism inspired by the Walker and E. coli crisis. I saw journalists come in and cover that story, and I saw what they, the power of telling a story can do. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Halifax, to Dalhousie University, to uh, a division of that at King's College, and I did my journalism degree in in there yeah wow so when if we would have asked you growing up what did you want to be when you grow up what would have that answer have been then to where you are now i actually put in my uh yearbook that i wanted to be a writer hmm. so i think i've known it for a really long time i had a wonderful grade four teacher named mr fish who saw that i had a, a talent with writing and really shone his light on it and brought it to the attention of my parents. And ever since then, I just loved to do it. It like something that brought me, I will say rest and peace. And I could get into a nice flow state and just, I love telling stories. So, and God's your... given me a lot of stories to tell ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. What yeah. are your favorite stories to tell? Um, I, I like real life stories. So I, I enjoy your podcast so much because it's real, it's real life. Um, and that's, I mean, that's where we, we learn from other people's experiences, other people's struggles. So I, I really enjoy, you know, those real moments, those hard moments, how people mm. came through to the other side of those hard moments and what they learned in the process. And so that's what I really enjoy, enjoy doing is sharing you know, what I've learned in the process of my own personal struggles and trials in hopes that it will help other people through theirs. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why Holly and I did this. I mean, doing a morning show together for so many years, you only have that much time with an artist or an author or an athlete or whomever that we wanted to dive into people's lives and, and hear about those real why me moments. So for somebody who grew up in the middle of nowhere uh, until, you know, <laughs> until you're put on the map, um, can you, th did you have any struggles as a child or was it more as you were growing up? Mm -hmm. It was a little bit later in life. There was some traumas, but for sure, I, I definitely had challenges as a child growing up that I wasn't even aware. I think 
we're not always aware that this is traumatic until yeah. you get through it. And then you look back and you're like, okay, that was traumatic. And that was yeah. traumatic. Right. So um, I wasn't fully aware, but I knew the first real trauma for, for me and my husband, we had just got married. We had just bought a house and we witnessed a plane crash. We heard a plane fly over our house and Graham was outside walking our dog at the time. And I was in the kitchen and literally the plane was so loud that it shook the walls of my house. And oh, I wow. ran out, it was November, it was freezing cold. We lived at a lake and I ran out just in time to see this plane land in the middle of a very cold lake, too far away from where we were to even be able to reach it. And all of the boats and canoes and kayaks and everything had been stored away for the winter. So this yeah. man crashed in the middle of our lake, literally had flown right over our house and he was calling for help and we couldn't get to him in time. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it was absolutely traumatic and I knew it at the time. And I, I called 911 knowing like nobody can help this person, which is horrible, right? I yeah. found out later that he was in his 80s. He loved to fly. Um, so he died doing what he loved. He was happily married. He had, you know, grown up children. He knew his grandkids and he had been a firefighter his whole life. So wow. that broke my heart. I thought like for years he helped other people and we just we couldn't help him, which was very traumatic. Oh. So that was kind of like the first, oh my goodness, this is traumatic. And I didn't even realize that I had you know, PTSD, or I, I like, um, mm. Mastin Kip calls it post-traumatic stress response, because it's not a disorder. It's a response to trauma. It's a natural response. And I didn't know I had that, but I knew that I was subconsciously, like I was avoiding flying for so many yeah. years. Mm. Right. So yeah. my husband went to, he got this once in a lifetime opportunity to climb Machu Picchu and wanted me to come with him. And I didn't go. I had like all these valid excuses, you know, I was raising littles and I, someone had to stay home and run the business and they sounded really valid. And then I didn't go to California with him on a business trip. And then I didn't go to Mexico on an all-inclusive, beautiful trip. So he took like his mom and dad and he took his brother and <laughs> he took other people. And it wasn't until I was on a plane because my friend called, she had had baby number two and was going through some postpartum depression challenges mm -hmm. and she needed help. And I knew it when she called me. And so I went on that plane to Winnipeg, which is only two hours from Ontario. But I'm telling you, uh, I had my first ever panic attack on that plane. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's ever had a panic attack, they know what I mean when I say I felt like I was going to die because mm -hmm. I really genuinely thought like my chest is coming or my heart is coming through my chest and I can hardly breathe. It feels like an elephant is sitting on me and I feel like I'm going to die. And it was in that moment where I didn't say it, an eloquent prayer. I said a very desperate, God, please help me right now. I don't know why this is happening. You could say, why me, right? Why is this happening right now? What is going on? I had no, I had no conscious awareness that, you know, I had a massive fear of flying and I had some healing mm. to do, right? Um, so that was kind of the first trauma that triggered the awareness that this is, something real. And I will say in that moment, I had a supernatural experience with God where I had the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I was like, wow, that scripture verse is so real right now, because immediately my, my whole body calmed down, my yeah. thoughts stopped racing. And he met me in that, in that desperate moment for sure. Yeah. Wow. I can't, I mean, I've had a panic attack or two and so I get it, but mine have been in the comfort of my own home. So to be in public, I think there's like the other extra layer of, oh goodness, like I can't breathe and no. I'm having a panic attack and people are here too. Yeah. There was a woman beside me actually, ironically or not, depending on how you view life, <laughs> yeah. um, who, who was a psychologist and she looked over and I was like trying to be quiet. Like I was counting yeah. down from 10 and I was trying everything, honestly. <laughs> um, and she looked over and she said, the sooner you realize that you're not in control of anything, the better off you're going to be. She said, your fear of flying is just a fear of being out of control. And I was like, mm. 
who is this woman? And yeah. that was all she said. It was like the voice of God in my life at the time. And she, <laughs> she did say, she's like, I'm a psychologist. And I'm just, I just feel to share that with you. And then literally she, she went to sleep during the most turbulence I think I've ever experienced on a plane. And I thought, wow, she really knows something that <laughs> I clearly don't know because yeah, I, it was a fear of being out of control. And isn't that what life is all about? We are, how much really are we in control? So those words of wisdom, along with my desperate prayer and God just being there in that moment really brought a lot of awareness to what I was struggling with. And the fact that actually, like, I, I worry myself into states that I didn't even realize I was doing. Yeah. How angry at her were you <laughs> for giving you a bill when you landed? And she goes, <laughs> Yeah, right. Psychologist. Yeah, she you know. sleeps through the whole rest of the session. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so oh um, my goodness. But what we don't realize though is that with with trauma and worry, it is incredibly debilitating. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody heal from that? Or how does somebody work their way through something like that? So yeah, it, it's been a process. It's been, it's been years of a process. And I tell everyone, I wrote the book after I, I've survived the storm of 10 years of even realizing, okay, this is a thing that I'm struggling with mm. to, to getting the healing that I need in the process. So part of that for me looked like I went and I had counseling um, mm -hmm. after the awareness. Okay. I have a fear of flying and I need to overcome that because what I was doing was I was making my life smaller. So the book is titled, don't let what if ruin what is. And that's exactly what was happening. My fear, my worry, my anxiety was closing, making, shrinking my life. Right. So I say no to all these wonderful trips that I will never get back with my husband. Thankfully I have future trips that I will get, but mm. um, yeah. you know, I, I can't go back. I can't, I can't, you know, hit, the sleep button on the nights that I stayed up worrying and going over every worst case scenario and Googling even more. Um, so I can't get that back. So it's been a process of counseling. It's been a process of digging deep into um, my childhood. I talk about inner work in this book and the importance of, you know, a mess is still a mess in the closet. I mm -hmm. shared the story, how my son, my oldest son, I love him so much, but my goodness he's he's just he's messy like he knows it we call him a messy genius he creates all these wonderful things with cardboard and the one day I said I, I just I reached the limit I'm like okay we are cleaning this room because I can't take it anymore and he helped me and I at one moment I got so overwhelmed I was like I just want to throw all of this in the closet and close the doors and not see it yeah. And I realized a mess is still a mess in the closet. And that's what a lot of adults do with their traumas and their pain and, and the things that they've been through in their life is they just want to throw it in the closet, close the doors, and I don't want to have to look at it or, you know, I'm fine. But then what happens is something comes along in our future and it triggers those past hurts, right? And so that's what I realized was so important for me to do is to go back and reevaluate all of the traumas. And I did a lot of that digging with counseling. I did a lot of that digging in prayer um, and just having awareness that I have to heal from some things in the past in order to be healthy and, and parent from a place of calm versus parenting from a place of worry all the time. Yeah. Two things really stand out for me is about just how you didn't just rely on prayer, but you also had therapy. Because I find sometimes mm. in the Christian community, they're like, oh, you're worried? Well, just pray harder. Maybe you're you're not praying properly. And it's almost a like you're being shamed for the feelings that you feel, and it makes you feel even more desperate. But having that coupled with people speaking into your life who are trained and professionals really can round out the healing process. It's so true. And, and I would read, you know, be anxious for nothing and worry not for tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Like, how do yeah. I practically implement that into my life? So when we just kind of throw scriptures at people or tell them to bring it to God in prayer, it's like, I think bringing it to God in prayer is important. Mm -hmm. uh, equally important is being willing to follow him in the direction of healing for yourself. So whatever he leads like that's where you want to go, right? You can't, it's not just, it might be for some an immediate 
solution, but I think a lot of times God works in a process and we need to be open and willing to go through that process and, and humble enough too, because it takes a lot to ask for help all around as moms, as humans, right? Um, it, it's hard to ask for help sometimes, but if we can be willing to do that and just admit, you know what, I need help with this. I'm struggling and I can't do this on my own. And there are people that are skilled who can come in and help you and want to help you um, and and are excited to be able to be that person and speak those good things into your life. Um, that's so important to, to be willing to do that. And so, yeah, I had to be willing to do that and willing to admit, you know, like this is something I struggle with. I don't know why necessarily. Uh, I'm sure that it started back in my childhood when there was some uncertainty and, and some insecurities. And as things happened later in my life, um, like I, almost losing my oldest when he was three, we had a crazy emergency life crisis in our family. And all of a sudden we're in London sick kids hospital getting blood transfusions and um, almost losing my husband. So I've, I've stood at bedsides and, you know, been in ICU units and it's really easier said than done to worry not for tomorrow and to be yeah. anxious for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and we need those people in our life at those moments, especially to speak into us and to, to reassure us. And, you know, you can trust that you're going to be okay. And you will get to the other side of this. What's interesting is one of the, the top Christian songs on radio, Jeremy Camp has a song called Anxious Heart. And he talks about the anxiety of losing his wife and how he had this anxiety that his wife now or his kids would would be killed or would be gone. And he had this anxiety about it. Then something like COVID had happened where we became isolated and we became uh, not allowing ourselves to have uh, communication with others. And so then that worry and anxiety then added on to everything. But the one thing that I want to, that I wanted to stress in, in asking you this is you went for help, you were getting help, but it wasn't just a one time, one fix thing. This is something that you've been working on because I think people feel like, oh, I'm going to go to a psychologist and I'll be good tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. No, it's been a process of 10 years for sure. And, you know, people have asked me recently, even just like, do you still worry? Yeah, I do still worry. Mm. That's real life stuff. You know, there's a lot to worry about in our world. And uh, when we look at the world, especially through the COVID crisis and everything, there's, you know, a million, a list of a million things that we could worry about. Um, but the difference now is that because I've done that work over the course of the 10 years, I have tools that allow me to, when my mind starts to go there, uh, allow me to pause and decide, okay, do I want to entertain this thought right now? Do I want to go there? Do I want to Google that? Do I want to allow my sleep to be interrupted again? Or do I want to choose to rest? Do I want to choose peace? Do I want to put my focus on something else other than that? Mm. And so experiential gratitude is something that works for me. Reading the Psalms is something that's helped me a lot. Um, so I have the tools now that I didn't have then, but yeah, it was not a one-off thing. It took a long time. It took 10 years. Um, and just last year I went back to school to, to, I went to a Christian counseling course because now I want to reach my hand back and help other people who are maybe going through something similar or something completely different. Um, and I want to give them those tools in the same way that somebody did for me so that they can know, yeah, you know what, you might still worry, you might still have anxiety or depression, um, but there's a way to handle living life with it and you don't have to suffer from it and it doesn't have mm -hmm. to steal from you. Yeah, that is so key. And also, I love what you say about like, you have a choice. And I feel sometimes when you're in the thick of it, like you are so worried, you can't see the forest for the trees. And you think I don't have a choice. This is my response that I have to have. And sometimes we feel so controlled by this is what we have to do. It's a part of who I am. But there's such a freeing moment when you realize, oh, I can reframe this. I don't have to feel the negative what's is there positive in this maybe there's not maybe there's a way that i can look at it from a different perspective and that's like that's like working out that's serious training and like you said it takes time 
Yeah. It takes putting the reps in. Right. And yeah. if you, if you think of like, for me personally, I think I've been a worrier since I was a child. Right. So that's a lot of reps put into letting my mind drift to places yeah. that are, you know, uncertain. So mm -hmm. to repattern that new thought life, it's not an easy process. It's not an overnight fix. Um, it takes time. It takes effort, just like, you know, working out in a gym takes effort. you got to put mm -hmm. those reps in and that's the only way that you get better, um, at doing it. Otherwise we are fueling the habit of worry if we are going in the opposite direction. So we can fuel that habit or we can fuel a habit of, you know, when things feel a little uncertain or I'm triggered, um, taking time away to just be still to, to, you know, meditate, to pray, to read, to do the things that calm us instead. Um, but yeah, I still have to you know, catch myself every once in a while, but that's exactly it. The empowerment of, okay, this, this is a choice. I can go here if I want to. And I say that to my kids, do you want to go there? Is that where you're headed right now? Because I can't come with you. Right. Um, if I come with you, then we're both having a pity party or whatever it is. Right. Um, but we, we do have the choice. We absolutely have the choice over the, the thoughts that we entertain. Um, and before I knew that we had the choice, I didn't think I did, but empowerment comes from getting the tools and the awareness of knowing, okay, this is, this is something that I am facing and I have the power to overcome it. You talk about things not being an overnight fix. It probably also doesn't take an overnight to write a book. Uh, was there specific <laughs> things maybe that you wanted to make sure that you pinpointed or things that you wanted to touch on? And were there new things maybe that you didn't think that you would be putting into it that you ended up uh, writing about? Yeah, so this this was definitely a process. This book was my second book. After the first one, I vowed I will never write a book again. Um, and we got to <laughs> be careful. <laughs> yeah, never, true, say never. never say never. Never say never, honestly. <laughs> honestly, because... No sooner had I literally held the first book in my hands than I heard the words don't let what if ruin what is and I knew it was the title of my second book and so I wrote it down in a journal and I laughed because I thought that's funny like I didn't want to ever do this again but I did. Um, and so going into this book, I did have uh, a plan for it I did have my own version of what it was going to look like. And I will say that it took on a completely different form over the course of about two years in the making. Mm. Um, six months into this, I was in a car accident and actually got a concussion from the car accident. And unfortunately, I had to pause everything in my life for a period of time. Um, so I did share that process in, in the book. It, it took a while to recover from. It was very frustrating um, in hindsight. I actually came along the path of another woman who was struggling with, with a similar situation after I had recovered from mine and I could meet her right in the moment of frustration that she was experiencing mm. because I know what that's like to have your life put on hold. Um, so I think sometimes looking back, we see that's, that's why I went through that or that's what that was for or that's what that could be used for. And that was the opportunity I was given with that. So I, I wrote that into the book. And then seven chapters in, I was sure it was done. And uh, two o'clock in the morning, I'm wide awake and I hear God say, write chapter eight. And I was like, it's done. What do you mean? It's, just, it's done. No. Um, and as I'm laying there, I just, the words just started to come for chapter eight. Um, the day before a staff member of mine had shared how eight what represented new beginnings Mm -hmm. I was like the day before, and then I hear right chapter eight. So it's like, it had to happen. So it took on a form all of its own. I would say definitely directed from God. Um, and he used kind of every, a lot of things. I'm very vulnerable in the book. A lot of things that my husband and I have been through in our life to, to show that, you know, he uses the bruises, right? And so that's what I would say. I shared a lot of my bruises in this process more than I thought I was going to share um, in the hopes that anyone going through these struggles or, you know, similar ones or different ones can see that if I can get to the other side after everything I've been through, and it's a lot, um, they can too, there is a way to get there. There is a way to get the help they need, and there is a way to overcome it and honestly live with peace. 
as mm-hmm. much as you can when you have three boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, incredible. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick, like hard right, because you're talking about, um, you know, the book, but you're also, you know, we've been talking about the reps and all of this seems like it's like the practice of being able to think in a different way to use your tools. And so I just I have to ask this question. At what point were you like, hey, I want to do a whole bunch of burpees? (laughs) <laughs> I know. Like, I, I, I hate know. burpees. <laughs> you know, you and everybody Nobody else. likes them. <laughs> My husband I, and I almost split up over burpees. <laughs> They're still going through counseling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I might need the counseling for loving burpees so much. Yes. I really do. I love what? them way too much. There's a running joke in our home. My, my oldest says, Mom, burpees will not be in heaven. They're definitely <laughs> in hell. <laughs> And I, I, you know, I say to him like, but I'll be the one who brings them to heaven. And then he says, well, nobody will like you in heaven. Mom. Um, and that's fair. That's fair. The uh, only person not liked in heaven. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we were going through COVID. My husband and I run a fitness business. That's actually like our primary source of income is fitness. Okay. That's what we do. That's our trade. He has his degree in kinesiology. Um, we own and operate New You Personal Training Studio in Listwell, Ontario. And our business got shut down for a total mm. actually of 11 months due to COVID mm. closures. Wow. And so I just felt like this is a time where we could, you know, have a legitimate pity party for ourselves. Like, because I mean, people were going through a lot of stuff. Uh, Obviously it was very serious. People are losing their life. Like it's horrible, horribly traumatic. I saw the looming mental health crisis with a lot of our clients. And I just felt like we can, we can go there or we can choose to do something positive that maybe inspires people um, that challenges me personally so my son had brought home from library day, the Guinness book of world records. And he was asking me questions about like, could I do something like this? And I, I was like, yeah, absolutely. You could, you know, this, you can do anything you work for. And that mm-hmm. was kind of the end of the conversation as we looked through this cool book. And the next day I was having my lunch break and I had just finished. We have an online business as well. We work with busy moms mm-hmm. And I had just finished a call with the moms where I said, children will be what they see, not what we tell them. Mm. And I felt so convicted. Like I told him he could do anything he works for, but maybe I should show him that you can do anything you work for. And so I really do like burpees (laughs) a lot. (laughs) And so I just Googled, you know, like most burpees done in one hour. And when I saw that it was 716, I knew that I could beat it. I didn't know by how much, but I just, something came inside of me and it was like, you can beat this. You can do this. And so I signed up right then and there. I'm a big believer in like, if you get that moment where it feels right, just you've got to do it before you overthink it. And so I went for it. I I applied to break the record and it was approved. And when I got the letter back, it was like a real moment where, okay, now I really got to do this. (laughs) It's going to be a lot of burpees. Um, but I did. And it was so cool for him to see like uh, that kind of went, you know, got a lot of publicity and went a lot of places. And it was fun for him to be on CTV National with me and share kind of how he prompted the whole thing because he really did. And um, him just seeing that moment of completion, like you really can do even the craziest of things if you put the reps in, if you put the hard work in. Um, it's amazing what we really can do if we're willing to make the effort right so here's I do the like problem too much. <laughs> i have a problem with this though allison <laughs> is that the record was 716 mm-hmm. so that means at 717 you could have stopped you quit. <laughs> but you decided yeah. to do the extras yes, that's that's true. that's the problem that i have is because that just makes me feel like even when i think <laughs> that i don't do more i can still do more yeah, you know, I, I had a woman, a wonderful woman at the side who was one of my judges counting the reps. And when I got to seven, I think it was like 720 or something like that. She's like, you didn't come this far to only come this far, which is funny. Wow. Because I say that when I teach my classes, but having yeah. that back to me, it was like, oh, fine. I'll, I wanted to lay yeah. down, you know, but yeah. like, I'll get back up. I'll keep getting back up, even if I'm tired, even if I don't want to. Um, even if I'm really not in the mood right now, 
Yeah. So we have more in us. And what's really mm. amazing about that story actually is that um, a woman just up the road from my house, like 20 minutes, broke my record. And she is a little <sighs> bit older than me. So I reached <laughs> out in a nice way at full respect because I was like, if if she did more burpees than I did. What's her and- number? <laughs> Belinda <laughs> Cox is her name. And she, she is a phys ed teacher and she did the same thing in COVID. She just saw my record broke. She thought, oh, I might be able to beat that. She totally did. And now we're amazing friends. It's so cool how things can happen like that, that connect you. Um, She might like burpees more than I do. We're both crazy. I know. (laughs) How many did she do? Uh, Her number, I I think she did, I, I, I might be wrong, but I think she did 700 and. 58 maybe and i think you could do 759 well yeah. you know what it is now someone in no. british columbia has the record at 815 yeah, no i quit yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm yeah. out tapping out no, I'm good. <laughs> i looked at it the other day and i thought i wonder if i could beat that yeah. <laughs> i'm not gonna no. go there just yet but that would be fun to try <laughs> minute number one 60 seconds in would be my why me moment yes yes <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, th- that's real life stuff. I was doing a workout just yesterday with my husband. We we work out together and I got the first round done and I was going, why? Why was this a good idea? Like, this mm-hmm. is not a good idea. Mm-hmm. But you get to the end and, you know, hindsight, it's, it's a good thing. You feel good getting to the good part, right? Um, but you got to push through the hard parts to get to the good part. So mentally, physically, emotionally, we have to, you know, just keep taking that next step to get to the good part. And there yeah. is a good part. I promise that. Yeah. Keep it's, doing the reps till it yeah, pays keep off. Keep doing the reps. It really does pay off. And the good part after that workout was laying down on a cold floor. There yeah. you go. Right. <laughs> you to get back up, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you alluded to a why me moment earlier on. Is there any other why me moments that uh, you would care to share today? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I talked a little bit about, you know, my son um, when he was three mm. and it was a definite why me moment. Um, I just noticed that he was pale and I took him to, I just happened to have a doctor's appointment because I was anemic and my, my doctor wanted to do some follow-up blood work. And I just noticed he was pale. That was literally it. And I thought, I'm going to bring him, you know, that mama gut moment. I'm going to bring him with me just to get his blood work done. Make sure he's not anemic too. And Mm. they did his blood work and it was the middle dead of winter. Um, We get home. There's a really bad snowstorm. I get a phone call at 10 o'clock at night from the lab. And they're like, you need to get your son to emerge right away. Um, His hemoglobin's at a 36. And I was like, are you sure? Like, he's fine. He's three. He's sound asleep. Like, I'm pretty sure, you know, we could get him up tomorrow. She's like, no, I don't think you understand. This is a life or death moment. And so my hu- I had a, a second child at the time who needed mom. So my husband took him in to emerge and they did another test and confirmed that this was an emergency. And they rushed him to London Sick, Kid- Sick Kids Hospital um, and did a bunch of tests. And for three days, we were in oncology and if it was kind of like a moment, how did we get here? Like, wasn't he fine? Like he just was a little bit pale. Um, but it ended up being that he had a rare blood disorder. And so we basically were at his bedside. Well, he got emergency blood transfusions, hoping that he was going to make it and told that he might not make it. Like it's, it's a very low hemoglobin and his heart was impacted a little bit because of that. Um, and just, at the bedside hoping and praying that he was going to be okay and wondering like how did we get here why are we here why why us after everything Mm -hmm. like my husband had gone through his ICU moment um just a few years before that the plane crash was just a few years before that and now we're facing this wondering is he is my son going to be okay and my husband and I both had what we like separate moments but interestingly enough almost at the same time He was going to the parking garage of the hospital and I was in the elevator um, because they needed me to go and grab some stuff, some of Andrew's clothes. And we both just said, hey, God, like he's yours, not ours. And it was just a moment of surrender and also questioning, you know, why, why? And are you there? 
And are you seeing what's going on? Like, obviously he is, but we all have those moments where our faith is tested and ours definitely was. And we both surrendered Andrew to God and, and trusted that, you know, these emergency blood transfusions are going to be the thing that helps him. Um, and then the weeks that followed, he, he bounced back and is a healthy, thriving 11 year old. We're grateful mm. every single day, even though some days he drives us crazy and he is the <laughs> messy one. And I like to be clean. So, you know, but we, we just appreciate the mess that he brings to this life because he is, you know, healthy and he's still here and he's here for a reason and a purpose. And we don't take it for granted because we know that not everyone does make it. Some people do mm -hmm. lose their children, but those moments, um, they really do define us and they test us in, in a big way. And I think that that, you know, that testing of like, what are you going to believe in this moment? Who are you going to go to in this moment? Mm -hmm. um, what are you going to question in this moment? those tests are really important because they, they truly get to the foundation of what we do believe, Yeah, you know? So yeah, that was definitely a why me moment for sure. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Don't let what if ruin what is a mom's guide to worry less and to live more. They are a couple that work out together. My wife and I are a couple that think about working out together <laughs> at the fit switch project. Uh, Allison, we appreciate you taking some time and uh, sharing your heart today. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, if you enjoyed what you heard today, like, subscribe, and check out more of our YouTube videos. Don't forget to follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and faithstrongtoday.com.